with um, Ivar. He, like you mentioned, he is the squawkability squawkabilly excuse me uh dunsparce guy and uh he is still out there cooking today with a team of samurai fluttermane rillaboom the galeri or excuse me the alolan muck uh garganical and a canto moltres uh you are seeing this correctly uh this is probably one of the most unique teams i've seen so far in the regulation e metagame and uh what a fun composition and some great partners for the more common mainstays of fluttermane and rillaboom yeah, I think so. the interesting thing about teams like this for Ivar is that a lot of the time you'd see a team like this and you'd say, oh, this will never do well. This is rubbish. Where are your good Pokemon? Where's your Lando check? Uh, but Ivar, as we see on the left here, got top 32 at Malmo with an equally bizarre team, arguably a more bizarre team. Um, I can't believe I forgot the Squawkabilly. Uh, and then also like strong 6-3 result results at Utrecht and Barcelona this season. So... Definitely no stranger to succeeding with weird teams like this. Um, he is a renowned chef, uh, if we go on the cooking analogy here. And he is up today against Joshua Ferreira. Um, so let's have a look at his team. So Josh Ferreira, a newer player to the scene, um, played in the World Cup for Venezuela last year. Um, so he is... Uh, as was pointed out in previous matches, one of those players who maybe this will be kind of a breakthrough event for him. Maybe it's a start into competing, um, but definitely not a player that can be counted out by any means. We do see a game where anyone can beat anyone. Yeah, and with a more uh, mainstay team as well, you know, with that uh, Wellspring, Mask, Ogre Pond, the Hisuian, Arcanine, Rillaboom, Annihilate, Iron Bundle, and Landorus, I think Joshua certainly has the tools he needs to uh, cook up his own recipe against what Ivar is bringing into this matchup. The biggest question on my mind as we look at the teams and how they're going to pair off against each other is just how much prep Ivar has done into these more common compositions, these more common teams teams. And I say common here, relatively speaking, as I would argue that Annihilate uh, is not very common right now in Regulation E. Iron Bundle uh, starting to pick up in popularity, especially if you look at the usage stats from the U.S. regionals happening this weekend in Sacramento. Uh, Hisui and Arcanine as well, sort of on the up and coming side. And, you know, the other thing that I also have to wonder is just, uh, you know, <laughs> what kind of approach do you take if you're Joshua going into this matchup? I, I feel like it would be very tempting to rely on like your Ogre Pond, your Landorus, your Iron Bundle, and just sort of try and craft a very tried and true approach to the matchup. But I, I feel like that might just be opening the door for Ivar to showcase just why he built the team he the way he did. Yeah, I think definitely much more likely that Igor is prepared for a team like Joshua's than Joshua having prepared for a team like Igor's. Uh, Ivar, uh, sorry. Um, I will say, though, I think Joshua's Annihilate could be a really pivotal piece in this matchup. Um, Eva doesn't really have any options to set up. Um, it doesn't really have any options to one-shot an Annihilate. It's got Will-O-Wisp um, on the Moltres, which could potentially burn it. But Moltres doesn't really like the matchup into the rest of uh, Joshua's team here. So I think this Annihilate could be very, very difficult for Eva to get through, especially when you consider that the only real speed on Eva's team is that Flutamane. Um, there's also the option for Tailwind with Moltres, but like I said, Moltres doesn't really like a lot of the Pokemon it's matched up into here. Um, and the only speed being that Fluttermane, uh, the Icy Wind that would normally threaten Landorus, uh, slow down the rest of this team, you can't click that next to Annihilate because you give it a free stack on its Rage Fist, and more importantly, you give it that plus two attack boost from its Defiant ability. Well, that's enough speculation on our part, Matt. Let's go ahead and get into game one of v the Netherlands versus Venezuela. And we'll be starting out right away with that Annihilate, like you called out, a key Pokemon in this matchup. But Ivar starting things off in his own unique way <laughs> with a Garganical and the Hisuian Samurott lead. Uh, I am so interested to see how this plays out. <laughs> uh... As we said, Annihilate is going to be a potential issue for this team, especially with the leftovers and the grassy trade recovery from Rillaboom. It's going to be very hard to take that out. Um, so I think this is a strong lead for Joshua here. 
Um, that really will also threatening a fake out if it needs to. Or, as I think we mentioned kind of before the match had started, there's also the option here for Joshua to go for U-turn on his own Annihilate. Um, it's four times resisted, so it's not really doing any damage here. And it just allows him to get an extra stack on that Rage Fist for free. Kanto Moltres returning to the field after what's been a very long time away from uh, VGC matchups as we get our first terrestrialization of the day. And it was very interesting to me just how quickly Ivar locked into the poison type Terra on that Garganical, not wanting to risk any fighting type damage from this Annihilate. We see the fake out go into that Moltres, but Annihilate not taking the bait, not attacking that Garganical just yet, instead going straight for the bulk up. Yeah, we see the bulk up from Annihilate here, which means uh, it's taking a lot less damage from uh, opposing physical Pokemon like that Hisuian Samurott we saw in the lead. Um, but this Moltres is now threatening Will-O-Wisp on the Annihilate, which is one thing we identified as a potential check to it. And also with the Terra Poison on uh, Garganical, uh, its ability of uh, Purifying Salt means it takes half damage from Ghost-type moves as well. So now it resists that Drain Punch because of the Poison typing. And it effectively resists the Rage Fist here from Annihilate. But the question now is, can that Salt Cure deal enough damage over time to outpace the healing that this uh, Annihilate is going to get? Hisuian Arcanine taking the field and intimidating that Garganical, but I agree. I don't think Salt Cures are trying to do the big damage needed to get KOs. Instead, it looks like Ivar is taking a slower approach to this matchup. No Will-O-Wisp yet. Instead, that Moltres setting up Tailwind to ensure that Garganical is a little bit faster in these upcoming turns. Yeah, a super good call from uh, Ivar there saying, look, I think that Joshua's going to try and protect his Annihilate from what seems like the obvious play there of Will-O-Wisp. Um, the extra benefit of going for that Tailwind there is, I mean, first of all, Annihilate's not that threatening this turn. It's Rage Fist is 100 base power, so it's not going to KO either of these Pokemon. So I think Moltres can afford to go for a Tailwind there. It also means this Arcanine is not going to outspeed Moltres this turn. So I think what Joshua was angling for there was protect the Annihilate, bring in the uh, Arcanine. Now that Moltres has uh, not got that Terrestrialization available to it, uh, going for, say, a head smash into that to get around a wide guard is a guaranteed KO, and then you're not free to go nuts. Well, instead of going for will o -Wisp this turn, instead we do see the Samurott take the field once again, just in time to get hit by a rock slide from that Hisuian Arcanine. And that Hisuian Arcanine is holding a choice ban, so it did so much damage, and it got the flinch on the Garganical. Annihilate finally able to go a little bit on the offensive, but it looks like the Salt Cure is almost starting to outpace the recovery of that Pokemon, so uh, it's a bit of a slow battle here for sure. Maybe the Hisuian Samurott took the field to try and threaten some Dark-type damage to that current Ghost-type Pokemon. Yeah, um, I think locking into Rockside here is risky, because this Gargantle does have Wide Guard, so that's now an option that Eva has available to them. Um, Annihilate's still not in the worst position here. We saw that Rage Fist didn't really do much damage to the Garganacle. Um Maybe Evar's going for an angle here where Samrot's got those sharpness boosted moves with high critical hit rate uh, on Aqua Cutter, or potentially just setting up a layer of spikes to stop the pivoting that seems to want to be happening in that slot next to the Annihilate. Yeah, and as we see Joshua lock in that terrestrialization on the Hisuian Arcanine, just a bit of a review for anybody at home who's uh, curious about what exactly this Hisuian Samurott does, as it's not a common Pokemon in VGC. Like you just mentioned, the uh, Sharpless ability will boost the strength of the Ceaseless Edge, uh, almost getting that KO on Arcanine outright, also setting up spikes on the field. So even though Samurott is knocked out by the subsequent Rock Slide and it looks like Garganical will have to take a bit more damage from this Rage Fist before getting the opportunity to attack this turn, unfortunately getting flinched again. Um, I think Samurott was able to accomplish what it was looking for in setting up those spikes on the field. Uh, the big question that I have though is that this Annihilate really doesn't seem like the Pokemon that wants to pivot around. So I think Ivar is hoping to maybe punish the Rillaboom when it comes back on the field with when the grassy terrain expires, or maybe even when it's knocked out right now by this Salt Cure. You see the Salt Cure taking out the Arcline there, which takes away the Intimidate uh, from Joshua's side, which, depending on what is in the back for Ivar here, could be kind of crucial. Um, 
But we've already seen the Moltres, which doesn't really care about Intimidate. We've got the Garganak on the field, who also doesn't really need its attack step very much. We do see that Rillaboom in the back end, so getting rid of the Arcanine is helpful for that. But now the Moltres can come back in. Uh, Joshua has lost the ability to... Uh, well, not lost the ability, but it's being punished harder now for trying to pivot around with those fake outs on Rillaboom, like you said, setting up the grassy terrain as well. Uh, and there's also the threat of Willowis again on this Annihilate. And we've seen, even now, without the burn, it's not really doing any damage to that Garganackle. Uh, Garganackle unable to recover for the last couple of turns, is what I imagine it was probably going for there, uh, thanks to the flinches. But even so, it's not really under that much threat here. I agree, and I think that if Joshua wants the Annihilate to be the cornerstone, if you will, not the Ogre Pine, um, of his strategy, he's really going to have to start finding opportunities to weave in some bulk up so he can go on the offense. Rillaboom will stop the Will-O-Wisp this turn with a fake out, but that Annihilate is still just going straight for those Rage Fists into the Moltres this time. Going to take a little bit of recoil damage, but overall putting Moltres in a position for a knockout next turn. Recover finally does happen, and the Garganicle is back at almost full health. And overall, uh, Ivar able to just sort of withstand that threat of fake out very well in this passive turn. Yeah, and we see that like even with the plus one boost, and even with um, one stack on its Rage Fist, and I'm not doing that much damage, this Moltres it looks like it's built very bulky. And we see the and my life's health is slowly going down, even though Evo's not attacking it. Thanks to that Salt Cure, thanks to that Rocky Helmet. Um, and now, without the Grassy Train on the field as well, Annihilate's going to be taking a lot more passive damage. So I think Evo's done a very good job so far of navigating his way around this Annihilate. But it's a case now, I think, of how you actually finish it off. Because you don't want to leave it on the field until it just eventually goes down to Salt Cure. Because it's going to get way too much damage off in the meantime. Exactly, and I think the other big missing piece of the puzzle here is what is Joshua's last Pokemon? We might not find out this turn, as Annihilate will go for bulk up to boost its attack and defenses, only to be hit by a Will-O-Wisp from that Moltres. So now its attack damage will be halved, which means it'll take even more time to deal damage to the Pokemon on Evar's field. Woodhammer into the Garganical, it's not very effective at all. Rillaboom taking some recoil damage as well, and we're going to get even more stacks of this intermediate turn damage with a Salt Cure connecting with that Rillaboom. Yeah, so Evar finally getting that burnout on the Annihilate, and again, that's even more passive damage. Um, that basically nullifies the leftovers. Um, so the way I like to think about it a lot of the time, if you burn a Leftovers Pokémon, you just take away all their recovery for the rest of the game. So now all damage on this Annihilate is permanent, unless it can go for some Drain Punches, but with the burn, you're not getting that much health back from that, just because you're not dealing very much damage. So I maybe would have liked to see Joshua pivot the Rillaboom out that turn, because Rillaboom, again, not really threatening either Pokémon on this team. And that might have been the chance for him to go for, as we mentioned earlier, that U-turn into his own Annihilate just to boost its damage output that little bit more and allow him to pivot that Rillaboom out, get Fake Out back on the field, and maybe uh, get the Grassy Terrain back up. Alright, well, we saw some damage go down into that Garganical. Moltres, though, or Moltres, and Moltres hanging on just in time to go for a Roost. We do see the pivot of the Rillaboom, but not targeting his own Annihilate like you were calling out earlier. Instead, going to deal a little bit more damage to that Garganical, and it's revealed that Landorus is the final Pokémon that Joshua brought into this matchup. So this ground-flying type Pokémon with access to Stomping Tantrum certainly will threaten that Garganical a lot better than the Rillaboom can, but will also now be taking that residual damage from Salt Cure. So a very slow approach to this game by Ivar, and Joshua just struggling to break through the bulk that Garganical brings to this matchup. Yeah, this is a tricky situation for Landris as well, because as you said, the Landris maybe wants to go for the Stomping Tantrum to try and hit the uh, Garganical here for super effective damage, but also it's threatening Rock Slide onto this Moltres. The problem is, the Wide Guard and this Garganical means that if you lock into that Rock Slide with your Choice Scarf, then Wide Guard will always shut that down. If you lock into Stomping Tantrum, then the Garganical can simply leave the field, go into, I think we saw the Rillaboom in the back end, uh, to take the Stomping Tantrum, and obviously you can't hit the Flying type Moltres with that. So it's, it feels like a bit of a, like, stuck between a, a bit of a rocky helmet and a hard place for the Landorus here in terms of what it wants to lock into. 
<laughs> Maybe a rocky helmet and a hard stone uh, if you want to <laughs> take you, the yeah. metaphor all the way through. <laughs> But there's that wide guard from the Garganical, so Ivar predicting a rock slide from that Landorus, but instead U-Turn is actually the move chosen. Uh, will take some recoil damage from the Rocky Helmet on that Moltres, and Joshua will be sending out that Rillaboom to reset terrain for the Annihilate. So a very interesting pivot there. I think that uh, Joshua just trying to keep this game pace as slow as possible, but being punished for it. Spike's doing a ton of damage to that Rillaboom when it takes the field, and Rillaboom now has to worry about also being the target of something like a Heat Wave from this Moltres. Rage Face Fist into the Garganical, not going to do much damage, and yet another Will Wisp connecting from this Moltres into the Rillaboom. Yeah, Evo just doing a good job of covering options there. Um... Moltres is only under threat from the Rock Slide, so the Wide Guard covers for that. I don't think Evo's too worried about um, a Stomping Tantrum going into the Garganacle. It'll definitely survive it, and that gives him a chance to get that Willowist spot on Landorus if it stays in, or Rillaboom if it switches. But again, that U-turn from Joshua into the Moltres, it's four times resisted, so it's not doing any damage. We've seen this built very bulky, and in fact, the Rocky Helmet damage on Landorus is uh, a problem there. And also, you're risking the Flame Body on Moltres, burning your Landorus. So again, in that situation, I'd have much preferred to see the U-turn into your own Annihilate. We've seen Annihilate is faster than Moltres, so if you can get those Rage Fist stacks up, maybe there's a chance you could eventually break through the Moltres. But for now, uh, Joshua's just going to call it quits as he realizes that there's just too much. Yeah, and even though Evar doesn't necessarily have to make any Pokemon adjustments going into this game number two, I would at least like to see the muck so we can have a chance <laughs> to talk about it. Uh, but it, let's go ahead and kick off this game number two. I Realistically speaking, I, I don't expect to see any adjustments from Evar as we wait to see what these trainers are going to lead. As the combination of that Garganical, the Moltres, the Samurai just did so well. We do see a lead adjustment from both these trainers, though. Uh, it is going to be the historical and Arcanine out on the field immediately with that Intimidate with the Annihilate alongside it for Joshua. And Ivar does continue to lead that Garganical. And once again, uh, the Rillaboom will be alongside it. Yeah, I think I like that um, lead change up from Joshua. Like I said, maybe trying to get some damage down immediately with that Arcanine is going to be a good option here because this Rillaboom is under so much threat uh, that it can, yeah, it can fake out the Arcanine, but that maybe gives a free bulk up to the Annihilate, for example, or if it tries to switch into Moltres, it's risking a Rock Slide. Uh, so it's a lot more offensive pressure from Joshua. And uh, that offensive pressure will just keep on going as Landorus Therian is the Pokemon that Joshua reveals as he switches that Hisuian Arcanine out. Fake out into that Landorus, and once again, Annihilate starting this game off with a bulk up. Interestingly enough, there was no terrestrialization yet from Ivar, going straight for the salt here, but not into that Annihilate, instead targeting down the Landorus. Yeah, I think you don't necessarily need to terrestrialize turn one if you're Ivar here. Firstly, because in game one, um, Ivar has shown that that's an he has, and that really shut down Annihilate. I don't think Annihilate's ever going to just go for a turn one um, drain punch into that. Um, the thing here is, we get a free bulk on Annihilate, but now we're probably going to see the Moltres come in here, I'd imagine. And it is the Moltres. Exactly. So you yeah. really want to try and get... Oh, sorry. Carry on. No, no, no. <laughs> please. Go ahead. <laughs> I was going to say, like, I think Joshua here might want to try and get his Arcanine back in um, to try and threaten that again. So we could see a U-turn here from the Landorus. I 100% agree, and I find it very interesting as well with a second poison-type terrestrialization on this Garganical that uh, Ivar seems to be following the same playbook that he followed in game number one. We do see a U-turn from that Landorus into the Moltres, taking a little bit of damage from that Rocky Helmet on the switch. Joshua now has the ability to drop the residual damage from the Salt Cure and also bring back the Arcanine. So even though Salt Cure is not going to be doing much damage, when it actually connects with these Pokemon, thanks to the three Intimidates that have now been stacked up on that Garganical, I think more importantly, Joshua is matching the slow speed that we saw Ivar bring in that game one with a second bulk up and now also with bringing that Arcanine to threaten a very powerful rock slide on that Moltres before it could possibly go for a Will-O-Wisp into the Annihilate. Yeah, so the positioning here from Joshua is much better. Um, I do like that Landorus went out. I think you know where I wanted that U-turn to go that turn. 
Um, <laughs> again, it's four times resisted you turn into Annihilate. You're not doing that much damage to yourself, and you don't risk the burn from the flame body, I think is the big issue there. Exactly, but at the same time, I can see why the temptation is to do damage on the opposing side of the field. A lot of times in the moment, it's very hard to remember that, yes, indeed, you can target your own Pokémon. And unfortunately for Joshua, his Sasuian Arcanine failed to target the Samurott on Ivar's side of the field with a head smash, but the Rage Fist is able to connect and bring it down to below half health. And uh, we also see that Garganical not opt to go for Wide Guard and instead just go straight for a Salt Cure into the Hisuian Arcanine. So a great prediction from Ivar there, recognizing that the Hisuian Arcanine did have a single target rock type attack it could lock into and uh, anticipating it with that switch. Yeah, exactly. A good call from Ivar there to not go for the Wide Guard. And I think even if Joshua does lock into Rock Slide, it's not doing a huge amount of damage and you can always just Wide Guard from then on, right? Um, and now this Samurai, thanks to the dodge there on the uh, Head Smash, is threatening the Arcanine here with a potential Water-type attack. Um, head Smash will pick it up, but I don't know if Joshua wants to risk a miss here. And I think Ivar probably had a backup plan there where if the uh, if the Samurai goes down, you can bring in your Rillaboom and you can go for a Fake Out. But I still think that miss is going to be potentially kind of costly for Joshua. I guess we'll have to see how these next couple of turns play out. Maybe it's costly, maybe it just gives the Annihilate another turn to set up as the Arcline takes out the Samurai this turn. Yeah, really, as long as there's not a threat of a well o -Wisp on the field, I think that Joshua can continue to click Rage Fist and just recognize, or not Rage Fist, excuse me, bulk up, uh, and just recognize that Ivar will not be connecting any damage with that Pokemon in fear of Rage Fist getting powered up. Lander Asterian out on the field, going to power down that Hisuian Samurott's attack power with an Intimidate. We see a Protect now from this Garganical. Aqua Cutter will connect with the Landorus, and thanks to the Sharpness boost, I think it's pretty uh, easy to ignore the Intimidate and deal enough damage to secure that KO. And now this Annihilate opting for Drain Punch. It is super effective to the Water Dark type Pokemon. Will pick up the KO on the Hisuian Samurott and bring that Annihilate's health all the way up back to full. I like that from Joshua there, electing to not risk another head smash miss, because um, Arcanine is really the key to getting rid of this Moltres here, which is the big threat to Annihilate. Um, so I like that play from Joshua to keep that safe. Obviously losing Landris there is not ideal, um, especially given the head smash miss the previous turn. But that keeps his main threat into the biggest Annihilate check alive. And I think this Annihilate has been much better managed this game. Um, Joshua did a very good job of not giving Ivar the opportunity to ever get into position to burn it or anything like that. Um, and now he's got a few bulk ups going, he's got uh, one stack on his Rage Fist, it's threatening a lot of damage now, and this Rillaboom is in a very tough spot. It is threatening a lot of damage. Rillaboom can use Fake Out for one turn though, to at least try and avoid taking some damage this turn, if that is something that Ivar is worried about. You can also try and go on the offense with Grassy Glide like he did lock into here, but Joshua not going to let this Arcanine go down yet. Will swap it out and send in his own Rillaboom as his final Pokemon into this matchup. And if there's one Pokemon that can take a Grassy Glide very well, it's going to be a Grass-type Pokemon like Rillaboom. We also see the Terrastalization now on the Annihilate. It is a Poison-type Terrastalization, which means it also will be taking these Grass-type attacks a lot better. Yeah, I like that from uh, Joshua. I maybe would have liked to see the Arcanine stay in there, just because if the Rillaboom goes down here, which it doesn't, um, that would have been a free switch into Moltres. Uh, but Joshua very um, cleverly identifying that he doesn't actually want to get rid of the Rillaboom this turn. He wants to get rid of the Rillaboom this uh, next turn so that he can get his Arcanine back in on the Moltres. Um, and we see the Salt Cure come out, uh, really taking a little bit of damage, uh, but not that impactful with the Grassy trade up. Everything's healing everything off uh, anyway. Yeah, it's also really interesting that both these trainers are essentially playing a ignore the Pokemon game with Joshua trying to ignore that Garganical overall and Ivar ignoring the Annihilate. You know, both the Pokemon ha have been allowed to just sit on the field the entire game, and really they're targeting down the 
the opposing partners of those Pokemon in order to try and find their way through the matchup so you can ultimately force a 2v1 situation. We do see that Moltres swap in for the Rillaboom, and here comes a Rage Fist into the Moltres. It does not do enough damage for the KO, but does do more damage than yes. a Fighting-type move. Yes! <laughs> we do see a U-turn finally into the Annihilate on Joshua's side of the field. I think another important thing to call out as well is that there was no Flame Body activation this turn either. Arcanine back on the field to intimidate Gar Garganical one more time. And now Garganical going for a Salt Cure into the Arcanine on the switch. Yeah. Um, like you said, uh, both players I think are playing a bit of a, a game of ignore one of the Pokemon on the other side of the field. Um, ignore the Terra Poison Pokemon. Got a big skull in it, you don't want to touch it. Um, but I think Arcanine, I'm oh, sorry, not Arcanine, I think Annihilate is a little bit harder to ignore than Garganacle is. Garganacle, it's throwing around those salt cures, it's very hard to kill. But Annihilate is threatening now to KO either Pokemon uh, in that Moltres slot here. And this Moltres is not running Protect. So there's a play here where Joshua can just take out the Moltres uh, for free. And if it switches into the Rillaboom, Rillaboom goes down, and then you just take out the Moltres regardless. Oh, unfortunately, the Flare Blitz from that Hisuian Arcanine will go straight into the Garganical, followed up by a Rage Fist on this Annihilate to pick up the KO on Moltres. So while Annihilate will take a little bit of recoil damage, unfortunately, no Flame Body boost or proc there to burn that Annihilate. So Joshua finally able to really threaten the two Pokemon that Ivar's brought to the side of his field. I think Garganical with a knockout range from another Flare Blitz or a Rage Fist at this point in time. And uh, Joshua able to find a way to match the very slow pacing that Ivar brought to this matchup. Yeah, I think that was a much better managed game by Joshua. Obviously, it's not over yet, um, but it seems very much in Joshua's favor at the moment. Um, this Rillaboom is not obviously going to be able to take a hit from either of these Pokemon, so whichever Pokemon it doesn't fake out, I think just picks up the KO, and Garganacle is not going to have enough left in the tank to try and break through uh, this, even if uh, Ivar there seemingly trying to switch his, uh, his fainted Moltres back in. Um, but it was very important information there to see that the Annihilate on Joshua's side is actually faster than Moltres. Um, I don't know if we saw that game one, thanks to the Tailwind, but that is super, super valuable information going into a potential game three. I absolutely agree, and I think that speed, uh, relative speeds on the field, is going to be so important as well when you consider that the Moltres did try and burn that Annihilate this turn. Uh, we can see that Garganical go for a recover to get some health back. We do see a fake out from that Rillaboom as well. So uh, it's going to be a few more turns, I think, until this game resolves, unless one of these trainers will lock in a forfeit early on. Um, so the other thing to keep an eye out here as we do wait for this game to sort of play its way down is just how the Rillaboom speeds compare relatively. I don't think we've actually seen these two Rillaboom on the field uh, where one is actively attacking uh, the other so far in this matchup. And if we get an indication here that the Rillaboom on Joshua's side is also faster than the Rillaboom on Ivar's side, uh, that could be another point in the favor of relying more on Tailwind in a game number three. But instead, uh, that's not going to happen as the Annihilate is just faster than the opposing Rillaboom from Ivar. We'll pick up the KO there. And with a flinch on the Garganical from a fake out, it looks like this poor poison type Garganical is going to be taking a ton of damage next turn uh, from both of Joshua's Pokemon. Yeah, I mean, Garganical could maybe survive a couple of turns here, but. I think at this point it's very much game over. I don't think we can ever break through either of these Pokemon. The uh, passive recovery from from the Annihilate uh, uh, leftovers and the grassy terrain, plus also a possible Drain Punch if it wants to start healing off that as well, is just going to be too much, I think, for this uh, Garganical. And I think, like I said, um, this is a much better played game from Joshua in that he just didn't allow the Moltres to ever get into a position to set up Tailwind to threaten those Will-O-Wisps. Um, and like you said, both players opting to just kind of ignore one of the Pokemon on the field. But the Garganacle, much less effective. Um, once a couple of turns have gone by, a lot less effective at actually being threatening. So you can afford to ignore it a lot more than you can afford to ignore an Annihilate. That has a couple of Rage Fist boosts. I think it's at three bulk ups now. And even if it's not doing, like, half even to Garganacle, it's still enough damage that it can knock out its partner and just deal with it in the end game. 
Exactly. And I think as well, the fact that Joshua still has the Rillaboom active. Um, and, you know, we saw how much damage that Wood Hammer did to the Garnacol. I, I think it might even be more valuable to just uh, forego the recoil damage from Wood Hammer. You turn into your own Annihilate continuously from here on out. Yes. And just get <laughs> to the point where you can one shot KO this Garnacol. You know, the other win condition here that I think is worth mentioning, given that this game is uh, slowing down, is that Evar could potentially play the timer here. Um, unfortunately, I think that uh, he's just not going to have enough in the tank to do so, as uh, 2v1 would ensure that Joshua wins the timer matchup as well as its number of Pokemon remaining first, uh, as like that first tiebreaker. Uh, but instead, Woodhammer plus Rage Fist is indeed enough to pick up the KO on that Garganical before it can recover, and we're going to go straight into a game three. So let's go ahead and start game number three and see if there will be any Pokemon adjustments from these trainers or if we're just going to be playing a game of when does the Arc or the Annihilate, excuse me, get burned? Uh, it might be sooner than you think as the leads <laughs> for these trainers is the Moltres and the Rillaboom side by side for Ivar and that Hisuian Arcanine with the Annihilate. And unlike previous situations for this Moltres with Fake Out being able to target that Arcanine, uh, there is one guaranteed turn here where you don't have to worry about taking some huge damage. Yeah, we're just going to see very quickly locking in from both players. Uh, both players know what they want to do. We get the Tailwind up again from Evar, which is nice, threatening the Willowisp. But it's worth noting here, I think, that Annihilate, without any boosts up or anything like that, isn't really locked into its field position at the moment. It can switch if it wants to, if it wants to dodge this Willowisp. Um, so that could open up the Arcanine to just take out Moltres um, early and try and save the Annihilate. Interestingly, we haven't seen the Garganacle lead from Evar, which we saw both of the previous two games, which maybe makes me think he hasn't brought it. I think that if he hasn't brought it, then, or if he has brought it, then that's exactly what he's hoping that Joshua is thinking, as Iron Bundle is a Pokemon adjustment from Joshua, activating its booster energy to boost its speed. And we have another adjustment here from Ivar. This time he will be Terrastalizing on turn two again, but it's that Moltres Terrastalizing into a Fairy type. This means it will no longer be taking super effective damage from those rock type attacks that the Arcanine can bring here and uh, will successfully connect that Will O Wisp with the Iron Bundle. But fortunately for that Pokemon, it's not going to be as decisive as it would have been otherwise. Oh. High Horsepower misses the Arcanine. That is a very unfortunate miss for. Evar as Rillaboom now just KO'd in one hit from that Flare Blitz on that Arcanine. That is very, very fortunate for, uh, for Joshua there. That 95% accurate move, not able to connect on the Arcanine. I think even with the Intimidate drop, probably would have been enough to knock it out. Um, I don't know if that Especially was just after... Sorry, Oops, sorry. Uh, Especially after Recoil. Yeah, with, with the, the Flare Blitz. Recoil, definitely, yeah. Um, I mean, still getting rid of the Rillaboom is nice, um, but Moltres stays on the field. The Iron Bundle is threatening it. I do like the Iron Bundle as an adjustment here. Um, just gives you something that's not scared of will o -Wisp. Um, it's the one thing on the team apart from Arcanine that isn't. Um, but this Arcanine is still in a really weird position, because it can terrestrialize into that Grass-type, as we saw, um, in the first game, but then it's still weak to the Heat Wave that's coming out from Moltres, or it can get burned by Moltres as well. Um, and I believe Aquacutter is 100% accurate, so there's no getting out by dodging this time. There is not, and also with a boost of damage and a high critical hit ratio as well, Aquacutter is a big threat for both the Pokemon on Joshua's side of the field. We do see Joshua terrestrialize the Hisuian Arcanine into a Grass-type Pokemon, so should be able to take that damage a little bit easier if it is the target of an Aquacutter, which, as we all know, it was, and it wasn't very effective, no critical hit. Hydro Pump does hit its mark turn one into the Moltres, bringing it down to just below half, and Heatwave oh. missing the Arcanine! That would've 
live again and picked up the KO full on that Pokemon. This Arcanine just, I think, uh, also known to eat sandwiches most likely for Joshua and yeah. just able to get the damage down where it counts, picking up a KO onto the Moltres with a Flare Blitz will be knocked out by that recoil. Oh no! Just barely able to hang oh, on wow. as well! This Arcanine, a very good dog for this Pokemon trainer. I am calling this Arcanine Houdini from now on because it is an escape artist. It dodges two moves that would have KO'd it, 95% and 90% accurate on either of them, and then survives the recoil damage, and that's a huge blow for Joshua, because again, that threat of Moltres burning the Annihilate is gone. And Samurai without access to Terrestrialization, Garganacle without access to, to Terrestrialization, both of these are now weak to Drain Punch. Um, so this Annihilate in the back is looking very, very threatening. Um, I don't know if we... Did we see the speed between um, Samurott and Annihilate? I don't know if we did. Uh, um, I, I believe we have not yet, because Tailwind was in play when the two were yeah. on the field. Just like it is in play now, which is why Joshua goes for a Protect on that Iron Bundle, trying to just wait out the remainder of the speed boost. Salt Cure into the Protecting Iron Bundle as well. Uh, so Samurott able to lock in that KO against the Hisuian Arcanine, and I think more importantly set up spikes as well. So even if the Annihilate is going to come back in this turn to take advantage of the fact that Tailwind has now expired, uh, it will be taking some damage when it takes the field. Yeah, I think that bit of spikes damage may be a bit too little too late here. Um, regardless of speeds on Samurott, there's always the threat of Rillaboom here with Grassy Glide, so you can just hit it with priority moves, and also the Icy Wind on Iron Bundle means you just slow down the Samurott. And again, I think here Joshua can just ignore the Garganacle for a bit until the Samurott goes down, and then it should be able to uh, get cleaned up in the late game with these threats like Hydro Pump, like Wood Hammer, um, like Drain Punch. All three of the remaining Pokemon on Joshua's side can hit that super effectively. Exactly, and I think that's why Ivar does opt to protect both of his Pokemon this turn, just to ensure that one of them is not KO'd by a Fake Out plus damage combination. We see the fake out from the Rillaboom and Freeze Dry is the attack of choice for this Iron Bundle into the Samurott. Yeah, I don't know if I like the double protect play there for the reason that Ivar is so far behind now in this game thanks to a couple of very fortunate dodges from that Arcanine um, that I think you can stall out the grassy terrain here but I think you really want to be trying to make calls to get yourself out of a corner this game. I think if you try and play it safe um, Joshua's going to be happy to while away a few turns, go for the guaranteed KO on the Samurott, well not guaranteed, but go for a much safer double up into Samurott this turn for example, uh, but that is not what we see actually. Yeah, Joshua I think making a correct prediction here that the Sucker Punch on that Samurott was Ivar's best option to KO that Iron Bundle before it was knocked out. Uh, by a freeze dry instead though attacking into that annihilate and taking a wood hammer from the rillaboom activating the focus sash held item that it has we'll stick around for one more turn as garganical targets down that rillaboom with a salt cure yeah the rillaboom taking a bit of passive damage now um but no salt cure down on the annihilate yet so that is free to heal up again um I don't know if there's really much of an out for Ivar uh, Eva here. Um, it feels like a relatively safe play to maybe go for a Drain Punch into the Samurott and just U-turn off the uh, Garganacle, for example, just to try and catch it detecting. Uh, but you want to get rid of the Samurott here, and once the Samurott goes down, I think it's pretty much game over, because Garganacle, as strong as it is as an, as an endgame Pokemon, cannot 1v3 three Pokemon that all hit it super effectively, I don't think. Yeah, and I think that's the biggest adjustment we've seen Joshua make in his playstyle between games one, two, and three. You know, in game number two, I think he successfully identified that the Garganical, you know, as annoying as it is with these salt cures, with the wide guards, with protect and recover access, uh, it's just not necessarily the Pokemon that you want to target down. Because especially knowing that it wants to stay on the field and sort of cling on to those Intimidates in particular, its best bet of doing damage is with the residual damage from Salt Cure. And at the end of the day, if you're able to keep 
grassy terrain on the field, if you're able to, you know, keep Annihilate not burned from that Moltres, you're able to match the recovery, um, or the, match the damage that the Salt Cure is doing with your own forms of recovery, and ultimately, uh, just slowly power up over time. So, even though this end game is going to be a bit slow, as it does seem that Joshua is doing a fantastic job of playing to his outs, uh, will be using Drain Punch in particular on Garganicle to recover the damage taken from the Samurott, uh, protecting the Iron Bundle just to ensure that uh, the Annihilate just has as much time as possible uh, to build up the damage via Rage Fist, via Bulk Up, um, and just via Leftovers Recovery. Um, I, I do think it's very uh, cool to see just how Joshua was able to identify Ivar's strategy and really uh, match it with his own Pokemon. That being said, though, I also really like Ivar's team. You know, I, we sort of mm -hmm. talked about how out there it was going into this matchup. And while I don't think it was necessarily the right timing for that Muck to take the field, probably not the matchup that it was looking for, yeah. um, I do think it's cool that Ivar has shown us that, you know, these Pokemon that uh, either took a break from BGC for a while, like the Garganical, or Pokemon that haven't really been seen in Regulation E, such as the Kanto Moltres or the Hisuian Samurott, um, still have a lot of play into the format. Yeah, I mean, I, I think as well it's worth noting that I mean, obviously, it's a risk you take when you click inaccurate moves, but there was also some unfortunate turns there, which really swung the game in Josh's favor. And I think had maybe that high horsepower or the heat wave connected, we could have really seen what these kind of less commonly used Pokemon were capable of.